All right, let's open up our Bibles, please. So Genesis 2. Genesis 2, please. The Lord here, he's uh, doing stuff in creation and all that over there in the garden. And he just finished making Adam. And he planted a garden eastward in Eden. And it says there in verse 9, Genesis 2, verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. So God looking out for Adam, thinking about him, he decides to make some trees that are pleasing to look at. Okay. And good for food. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord, and we thank you for this chance for us to come together here at Bible Baptist Church to learn more about you and your work. And Father, just as she fills with the Spirit of God as we talk about my favorite topic in life, which is food. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things especially for the salvation that was given by your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And here we see that God, before the fall, decided that food was really important, so he decided to make some. Okay. You know, preacher is talking about why we love our wives. That's one reason I love mine. Food is good. Okay. But what's interesting here is, yes, this is... You know, the Lord, historically, he puts the trees there and he's making them for food. That's for like bananas and that kind of stuff. But also the scriptures say that men are as trees. Okay. And so if that's the case, we were actually made good to partake of food as well. And that way you can see that spiritual application there. Okay. And the reality is food's pretty important. Okay. You like food? <laughs> uh, just checking, just making sure people are normal here. Lily's like, nah, man, I, I gotta work in a restaurant every day. Uh, okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, I, I don't like cyclotrons either. They work on them all the time. But this is what happens. Food is important. Okay, and the question is, what kind of food is important to people like us, Christians? Well, the first obvious one is physical food. That's what was made there in the garden. Go to Luke 24. Luke 24. Let's take a look at this. You might wonder, well. I mean, food's good for energy and all this. I mean, yeah, but it's a little more going on there. Okay. It's not the only reason we eat. Okay. There's going to be a time, Christian, when you're going to have your glorified body, kind of like Jesus we're going to see here, and he doesn't need to eat food for energy, yet he's eating it. You wonder, what's the point? Okay. See? Luke 24, go to verse 36, the Bible says, and as they thus spake, that's the disciples, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So they're over there in the room, they're gathered, they're speaking stuff, and then the Lord just appears right in the midst and decides to join the fellowship, if you will. He wants to come and be in the reunion. And he says, Peace be unto you. 37. But when they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit, which I don't blame them, okay? I mean, this guy just appeared out of nowhere. What's going on here? Okay? 38. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. Makes me wonder if John grabbed the Lord then when he said he handled the word of life. Okay. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And here he's testifying to the truth of the spiritual body you're going to have. Okay. You're going to have a physical body, it just will never corrupt again. Okay. But notice how he confirms it. Verse 40. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet so they can see he's got the prints in his hands and in his feet and in his side. You know, I'm, I am that Jesus that died on the cross there. And I'm, I'm born or I've come again in the resurrection. 41. And while they yet believe not for joy, the shock is still there, but now it's starting to transform from being terrified and afraid. He's like, wow, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Okay? And wondered. He said unto them, have you here any need? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And so he decided to prove that he was really there by eating some food. Okay. And when he did that, you notice that he took people that were caught up and affrighted in a rough situation and helped bring ease to them. Okay. That's what food does, doesn't it? Okay. You ever come from work and have a rough day? Okay. Things are weighed out and it's rough. Okay. 
But you come home, you get gathered with people that you love, and you sit down there at the table, and all of a sudden you're blessed with something. All right? Okay. Okay, maybe we need a picture. Everybody close their eyes for a second. Let's just picture this. Okay, just close your eyes. Now, now think about you having big stress in the day, you had a rough day at work, but you come home, you're gathered with a lot of the people that you love, and all of a sudden your favorite dish that exists in the universe just appears right there in front of you, okay? And you take the time, you relax, you get prepped, you get your napkin, you get your juice ready and all that, and you start to decide to go ahead and partake of that, and just to savor that. Think about what that tastes like, okay? How much you enjoy it, and how it brings you at ease. Just like, this is great, okay? It's because physical food gives you comfort, okay? Now with that, I guess we should end the service. Let's all go eat, right? <laughs> no? Okay. But this is the idea, okay? Paul even said that with food and raiment, we should therewith be content because it does really bring happiness to us. It's why we come together oftentimes to eat. We're Baptists after all, okay? Maybe you just thought that was a cool custom and all that for Baptists, but not really. It's actually biblical. See that? There's your justification. So we need to do that more. We need to get together and eat more, okay? Now, I don't know what you were picturing, but I was picturing some buffalo pizza. You know, when they, when they fry and the pepperoni kind of rises up and the, the edges are like, only the edges are black and there's like a little bit of grease in each and every pepperoni. It's really thick. You just take a bite. Oh, oh my goodness. I don't know. You, that's, that's, what, that's why I said I needed to go. Stuff is good. Comfort. That's what it brings you. It lifts your spirits. It helps you forget about the wiles of the day and just relax in the situation. Just like you saw with the disciples, they were scared. They didn't know what was going on. And Lord said, just relax here, let's just, let's just eat. Yeah? And their fears were gone. It was replaced with joy. You see? Yeah. And so we see it seems to be pretty important. That's probably why you're going to be eaten in heaven. You see? Because it's just fun. Did you have fun eating? Yeah. Even Jesus in his glorified body seems to be enjoying some fish. But many of us know that there's all types of food out there, okay? Maybe you've heard of something called soul food, right? Go to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. And I don't know about you, but soul food seems to be just like, you know, it's physical food, obviously, okay? But one reason why it brings so much comfort is because it just relaxes you. It's so heavy and dense, okay? It just makes you basically melt in your chair, okay? And so food seems to have a, a connection with the food for your soul. Because Matthew 4, verse 4, Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Okay. Peter also said that as newborn babies, we need to desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And Job even mentioned that he esteemed the words of God Almighty more than his necessary food, more than that physical food. Because the reality is, the true food for your soul isn't just going to bring comfort, it's also going to edify you and help you grow. Okay? See, physical food will lift you up, okay? But soul food will make you a different person. It's going to affect your being. And this is where we get to the difference as Christians. You start realizing that there's more ways to eat than just enjoying a burger and some fries or whatnot. Okay? Or some rice and beans for some of us here. See? There's a way to partake of these words right here, and they're going to have an effect. Okay? You were made as a tree, okay? And if you're planting those rivers of water and all these things, you're going to partake of the words. They're going to delight you day and night, like it says in Psalm 1, and it's going to affect your soul. Okay? Now, what's interesting about this is that the word of God... Here it's being compared to bread, right? And we just saw that Peter compared it to milk. The reality is, so food, that is the scriptures, compared to every single important food group that you can find physically. Is that a coincidence? You think? Everybody seen that crazy pyramid we used to see when we were in grammar school? They had that pyramid in the cafeteria, right? Got the, the sparingly with the sugars and all that. And what we usually do is flip the pyramid and make that the big one, right? We, we eat mostly the sugars. Okay, and put the bread at the top and the bottom, you know. But you got all the different food groups, and believe it or not, the scriptures satisfy all those things. Okay. We mentioned milk, right? Go to Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7, please. Go 
Isaiah 7. Now verse 14 talks about that the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they'll call his name Emmanuel. This is actually talking about the Savior. But then it says in verse 15, and we're supposed to be like him as Christians, right? That's what it means. Christian, your little Christ. Okay. Isaiah 7 verse 15 Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. And butter is made out of what? Milk and all this stuff. Okay? It's a dairy product. Reason why babies need to drink milk is that they can start growing and they can start learning things. But as you grow in grace and knowledge and get more of that soul food, God's going to show you the differences between that which is good and evil and help you refuse the evil and choose the good. Because it's not enough to just identify it. Okay? God has to work with your soul and allow you to be built up so you can make that decision to say no to the bad things and yes to the good. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you couldn't do that with regular things in life, but when it comes to spiritual things, you're a babe. Okay? We need to learn this stuff. Even Jesus Christ increased in wisdom and learning. Okay? The Bible says. And the same is true with us. And so what kind of ideas would this fall under for us? Well, if you're partaking of your milk in this way, okay, maybe you'll realize maybe I should go to church. Okay. That might be a new thing for some people. Okay. Not everybody grew up with a, a background in Christendom where there might have been a regular thing. So that might be new to you. Or what's pretty much new for every person is reading the Bible daily. Okay, Because babies eat every day. Okay. Do you eat every day? Drinking that milk. Well, then it also mentioned honey there. Go to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, and as you can see, yeah, you got your butter, okay? Your important fats, if you will. But you got your sweets, okay? Taking care of that top part of that pyramid there. Proverbs 16. And verse 23. Now, it's interesting, Jesus ate broiled fish in a honeycomb. Okay, so I understand what the honey refers to now. Proverbs 16, verse 23. The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul, because it's soul food, and health to your bones. It's also physical food. And in fact, if you partake of the food, which is the word of God, it actually affects your body. Okay. I don't know how many people here are aware of the fancy term called psychosomatic effects. Okay, psycho, soul, somatic, soma, your body. That's all it means. I don't know why scientists act like it's a cool thing. Okay, but the idea is, okay, people talk about you are what you eat, or you know that's going to affect your being. It'll make you marry. We just talked about this stuff. That's a reality. Okay, and it'll even affect how long you live. The Bible has a blessing that tells you that you'll live longer physically if you partake of it. Believe it or not. Okay? It's part of the grace that's instilled from partaking of this for your soul. That's your body. And so Jesus Christ decided to eat that fish. We'll look at that in a minute. And that honeycomb, he was preparing his, wise, his lips for wise words. And he said a lot of things to the disciples before he left in the ascension, didn't he? Okay. So the milk helps you to recognize good and evil and then refuse the evil and choose the good. And then the honey helps you learn how to speak these things. To others. Okay. Now here's where the unfortunate thing happens because most Christians stop here when it comes to soul food and they live on just milk and honey for 30 years and that's why they don't grow. Okay. Unfortunately they're not partaking of the right soul food they flip that pyramid as we know. Okay, You're not going to be doing well if you're always eating Doritos and candy bars. It's not going to work out for you even though I wish it did. And so you got to have some fruit. It's one of them groups, right? Go to Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. And it's not a coincidence that this all, you know, is illustrated by physical food because God, being the spiritual being who created everything, made sure that there are illustrations in the physical things he made. Okay? He's revealed through all these things. Proverbs 25 and verse 11, the Bible says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. And obviously the word of God is fitly spoken. Okay? 
And it's like an apple of gold because gold is tied to God and you get more of him as you partake of these words. But now you're not just learning how to speak, you're learning how to fitly speak, how to properly speak, know when to speak and when not. That bears fruit. Okay, your soul. A lot of people who get saved often start talking a little less because they want to be careful with their words. That shows you're looking for something that's fitly spoken with your speech. It's not a coincidence, God. Okay. You can imagine I was a talker when I was lost, God. Okay. Now I'm afraid to talk because I'm probably going to get somebody mad. Okay. But still, okay. learning when to talk is just as important as knowing what to say. That makes sense. And if you're to be fit, obviously, physically, you better be eating fruit. That'll help you, wouldn't it? Okay? Like I said, you just eating them candy bars ain't going to do justice. But fruit, obviously enough, helps get your body's metabolism cooking, so to speak, so you can burn some fat. Okay? Isn't that true? Okay? So words fitly spoken do the same. They have an effect on you and others. But it's not just fruit. Okay, because fruit tends to be the things we like in the scriptures and blessings. Okay, sometimes you got to get some bitter herbs in your system. Go to Ezekiel 4. Yep, yep, that means your kale. I'm sorry, that means your broccoli. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. Look, I'm not a fan of Brussels sprouts either, but we got to run with them. Ezekiel 4. Ezekiel 4. And verse 7 here, the Lord is telling Ezekiel how he wants him to be an illustration for what is going to happen to Israel very soon. And part of the illustration we're going to see is having basically Ezekiel laying on his side for over 300 days. Just laying there. He has to stay in the spot and God's going to prepare him with the meal he needs to survive. As he's preaching about what's going to happen to Israel for the next 300 something years. It's very interesting. But then he says in Ezekiel 4, and verse 7, Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. Take thou also unto thee wheat, and barley, and beans, and lentils, and millet, and fitches, and put them in one vessel, and make thee bread thereof, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side, three hundred and ninety days shalt thou eat thereof. And thy meat which thou shalt eat shall be by weight, twenty shekels a day, from time to time shalt thou eat it. The Lord got them all set up here. Okay? But the idea here is that verse 9 is showing you that there's some importance to grain and vegetables as well, and it's tied to the bitter reality of some prophecy. Okay? Not everything's roses in the scriptures. There's a lot there that's great, okay? but the scripture's full of truth, and sometimes some truth is hurts. Okay? It's rough, but it's still good for you. Okay? That's why mama made me eat my Brussels sprouts. Okay? Man, I don't like how they taste it, but they're good for my body. Likewise, okay, there's parts of the scriptures that will help your soul, even if they initially taste a little bitter. Okay? And that might be because God's showing you something he wants you to correct. Okay? Now, hopefully you're still eating your vegetables, ladies and gents. I hope so. Okay? You know, my babies are always over there trying to fight. Not eat certain vegetables. I don't like broccoli. Okay, so we cheat and we give them green beans. Okay, it works out. They like those. Okay. Don't add any sugar to them. I don't want to cheat. Okay. But we got to make sure that we partake of these things. And as you saw here, then vegetables are used to make a specific kind of bread. And many of you can buy Ezekiel bread at the store. Ever buy some? It's very hearty. Okay. One piece of that bread is like, I don't know, it'll power you up for a while, okay? It only, you can only eat one. It's kind of weird, really small, okay? There's just a lot in there, okay? Bread, bread, what kind of bread do you need? First Corinthians 5, First Corinthians 5. And you can see here that these vegetables amalgamate together to come up with, I guess, a bigger doctrine, which is bread, if you will. And there's all your food groups in the pyramid. That's everything you're supposed to be eating. Okay. First Corinthians 5 
in verse 6. Paul says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? And the leaven is often tied to like yeast for bread, right? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover sacrifice for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And here we see that bread is tied to it being unleavened. It's unspotted bread. It's perfect. There's no nothing bad in it. Okay, It's not wonder bread is what I'm saying. Okay. If you look up what's missing in Wonder Bread, you can avoid it, like the plague. Okay, Even though it tastes good. And there's sincerity and truth. The truth of the scriptures and the sincerity to practice them from within towards God and manifest it to others. Okay. And so it seems like all this soul food, just like the physical food, yeah, that comforts you. But the soul food edifies you and helps you grow in grace and knowledge of the Savior and grow closer to Him. And become more like him. Okay. Now, here's the issue with this. That there are a lot of Christians today who, for example, recognize that they have the unleavened bread. They have this book in English. They know this every word of God in here is pure. They figure that out. Okay. And they learn all kinds of things in the scriptures, all these deep things, but they never actually do anything with it. Okay. And so you know what happens when you eat a lot of soul food? Okay. You eat a lot of collard greens and Ham hocks and all that stuff. That stuff is good. Okay. Kind of grow this way. Okay. Makes it very hard to walk around and do something. Right? See? What you're supposed to do is, yeah, you have to eat that. I mean, we got to eat. Okay. But you got to take that energy and put it into practice. You got to utilize it so that you don't grow this way. You grow proper. Okay. You grow balanced and fit. But many Christians don't do that. Preacher brought up a different illustration about Christians being like sponges and they soak and soak up, soak up the word. And I'm going to get to the water in a minute. They soak it up, but then they don't allow themselves to be a springe by the spirit of God. And for that reason, I'd add that they get musty and disgusting and grow mold. Okay. They smell bad to God. That's because they got too much soul food and they end up focusing on themselves instead of taking that and utilizing it for God's work. And that brings us to spiritual food as well. Food for your spirit specifically. Go to Job 12. Job 12. Now this one's kind of unique. I'll admit. Not what we think of when it comes to food. We think about relaxing and eating. Okay. But the Bible says in Job 12 verse 11, Doth not the ear try words? So this is... Something you try with your ears, something you hear. And the mouth tastes his meat. Okay. And Jesus Christ, the Bible incarnate, he said that his words, they are spirit and they are life. And we're supposed to try his words with our ear and taste them like meat and re realize and taste and see that the Lord is good. Why? Because technically, Christian, you serve God by your spirit. Romans 1 verse 9. That's how you serve God. Okay. And I say, well, didn't you just talk about the word? Okay. Well, the thing about eating fruits and veggies and all this, you don't really understand where all the health is. Okay? But when you get understanding, you recognize there's all kinds of water, for example, in fruit. Okay? And all these heavier things in the scriptures, whether it's bread or actual meat, that's meat. And that's supposed to drive you to get the strength to your fibers. And the water, make sure you're not dehydrated so you can go out and do something. You say? Okay. The idea being that if Jesus Christ is preaching to you and you're hearing it, it's going to have an effect on your heart and it's going to motivate you to go out and do something. That's called exhortation. As in all the types of food tied to the three parts of prophesying. Comfort, exhortation, edification. To the three parts of your being. So you can be sanctified holy. Okay. So then you need to actually live for God. That's actually spiritual food because that draws you nigh to him, which is the actual major goal. It's to know him personally and allow you to grow closer to him. That's what matters. Okay, Be more like Christ. Okay? And when you do that, you end up bearing the fruit of the spirit that others can see. Okay? And so when you do that, when you exercise your faith, yeah, by the exercise prophets, just, just a little though, but godliness 
That's what profits the most, okay? And you have to exercise your faith. What does that look like, okay? Well, spiritual meat, the Bible says that your heart's supposed to be established with grace and not with meat. Meats are deeper doctrines in the Bible, okay? That deeper bread, that complicated stuff. It's okay to learn it, but if that's all you're doing, then you're missing something. You need to establish your heart with grace so you go out and do something. Then you'll be like Jesus. Go to John 4. John 4. Notice what he said here. And this is odd. Okay. This is what ties into this thing here. John 4, verse 31. And he just talked to the Samaritan woman here and witnessed to her and all this. And then it says in John 4, verse 31, In the mean, while his disciples prayed him, so they wanted to ask him something, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. So he's telling you there's more than just physical food right there. But the Lord just, just tells you, you have to figure it out, okay? Kind of spelled it out for you this evening. 33. Therefore, said so the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him on to eat? They're all thinking, what, did you already eat already? Who did this? Who went through all this work to get him some food? Okay? Nobody told us. Okay? I always feel bad when I when I go to work and I bring food for lunch and then everybody's got like bringing food in and all this, having a like a, a weird, you know, fiesta or something over there at work. And I'm like, no, I gotta eat, I gotta eat my wife's food, man. Sorry. <laughs> Wish I knew about it. So you good. Kind of see what's going on there. But then Jesus answers verse 34, and here's the key part. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Notice that. Say ye not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Are you paying attention? Okay. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, the fruit of the Spirit, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And there Jesus is trying to tell you that spiritual food is actively working to win souls. You partook of that physical food to get you into the church. You partook of the soul food of the scriptures in order to understand why you need to grow in grace and knowledge and live for God. Now you need to go ahead and take your eyeballs and go out and look in the world and go out and start telling people about it. That's a spiritual food, doing the will of him that sent you and finishing his work. So starting and finishing. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of your faith. He'll be with you in every step of the way, but you got to have your eyes set on him so you can walk with him. Okay. And this is what's missing. Okay. A lot of Christians, oh, they love they love to eat physical food. We know that. Okay. And some of them, they got all the soul food they love. They love them deeper doctrines. Let's talk about the Trinity. Let's talk about how, you know, the deeper stuff. We talked about some of that this morning, right? Okay. But they don't like the simplest thing ever, which is to go out and tell people about Christ. And that's the most important thing. Isn't that weird? Okay. That's how you serve God in your spirit. So you're actively working to win souls. It's not a passive thing. You're trying to look out and recognize, look, the harvest is white. It's ripe. It's ready already there. People think, well, we're still working. We're still working the field, really. God's been working it for a while before you showed up. Okay? And if you're spiritual, you'll recognize this and play your part. Okay? Knowing that God's going to ensure you win the war in every battle because he's with you. But you got to make a step. But God is balanced. It's not just the thicker meats of that stuff. Okay, It's also spiritual drink. Go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10 and verse 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I would now that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. This is talking about what happened uh, when Israel was, was escaping, being redeemed from Egypt, and they crossed the Red Sea. Okay. Paul calls that a baptism. So that there's water everywhere here. Verse 4. And they did all drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And, you know, Moses broke... He hit a rock or whatever, and water came out. Okay. So there's also spiritual drink 
rich is water. And the Bible says that you're sanctified by the washing of the water by the word. Yeah. So it's not just you simply going out and trying to fulfill God's will in your life by witnessing. It's also allowing him to cleanse you. Yeah. And to make you more like his son so people can see him better through your actions. Okay. You're actively working to have a testimony. You're actively working to sin less. You're actively working for your new man to grow. Okay. People tend to think that just reading the scriptures is a passive thing. No, there's an active component of you purposing in your heart to continue to want to become more like your Savior. Okay. And that's part of fulfilling his will in your life. Now, the reason why Paul mentioned this to the Corinthian church is he was trying to give them an illustration about things that they need to fix. So he says in verse 6, okay. now take a look at this. This is true for all of us. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not last after evil things. Remember, we got that milk. It was to refuse the evil and choose the good. Okay. When, how do we push back against that lust so we don't want to chase it anymore? Well, if we have the example and we put it into practice, that's how we refuse. Otherwise, we just have the knowledge of it as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the same people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. I guess they got caught up in their physical food and started focusing on that instead of God. God. And we come together to eat together in fellowship. That's great, but we shouldn't lose sight of why, why we're together and that's our safety. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. That's something to read right there. Verse nine. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Because they didn't look up at the brazen serpent. They didn't look up to the person who was up there at the cross, if you will, so they could live. And they died. Okay? So they had to do was look. You didn't even have to climb the poles. Just look. Couldn't even do that. Okay? Jesus Christ said we got to be able to look. Look at the fields and pay attention. The, the harvest is there. Many Christians don't want to look. They do this when it comes to that. That's why they say, I don't need a witness. What? Okay. 90% of humanity is lost. What are you talking about? Okay. They don't want to partake of that spiritual food. They don't want to exercise their faith. Now, all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are coming. So, yes, if you partake of the spiritual food, you're going to go out and live for God. That simple. Okay. And your exercise is going to make you fit in God's eyes so he can continue to use you as you continue to grow in grace and knowledge. Okay? And so to conclude, go to Genesis 6. Genesis 6. Genesis 6 and verse 21. Interesting verse here. And so now that we know about all this great food that's in the Bible here and this great food that God gave us, okay, now he's saying to us, and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten. Okay, Now that you know about these things, why don't you gather them up? Why don't you take of them? Maybe you didn't realize the importance of the Bible. Maybe you didn't realize the importance of looking for God in prayer or the importance of going to church or the importance of just telling somebody about Christ. Maybe you didn't know that before this. But now you do, so take of it, okay? And thou shalt gather it to thee, but not only that, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. And, <coughs> brother, and this is the key here. Okay? First question is, are you properly eating? Okay. Are, you, are you having your balanced breakfast? Okay. Which for me is coffee in the Bible. Okay. Wouldn't suggest it at all. The night shift is weird. Okay. Are you properly eating? Okay. Are you also sharing what you're partaking of? Because it really doesn't mean much for you to come here and learn these things if you're not going to go out and tell people about the person you're learning about. Okay. And that's the biggest purpose of all. Remember that Jesus Christ, when he went there and dealt with the disciples there and showed them his glorified body and all these things to confirm the reality he had resurrected, 40 days later, he goes up and tells them, you're going to be witnesses unto me. First thing he tells them, Go out, okay? Because he doesn't want them to be spiritually bloated, okay? He desired them to exercise their faith, and you can see that the result of that was them basically turning the world upside down. <coughs> and so, Christian, are you, are you properly partaking of your food? 
And are you properly utilizing it for the glory of God? <laughs> uh, Brother Edward, mind closing out some prayers here? Well, Heavenly Father, thank, thank you, Father God, once more for you. And 